Good morning, everyone. Uh, good morning from Brazil. Uh, for those who don't know me, my name is Ana Fabia Furtado. I am the Institutional Development Advisor at CAMCCVC. On behalf of CAMCCVC and myself, I would like to welcome each and every one of you to the webinar Arbitration in Latin America, Energy and Natural Resources Disputes. First and foremost, it's an honor and a privilege to host this event. I thank Peter Sester and Felipe Spirangio for putting together this amazing panel. I am also very grateful for our guests for accepting this invitation and joining us for a very necessary discussion regarding international arbitration, especially when it comes to energy and natural resources disputes. So before we begin, I would like to say a few words about CAMC CDC. Today, we are administering over 300 ADR proceedings. All the case managers are administering those proceedings from, from their homes. Among those 300 proceedings, we have arbitrations, mediations, dispute boards, and emergency arbitrators, uh, emergency arbitrator proceedings. Although this is a very challenging period, CAMC CDC managed to remotely carry on all, its, all of its activities. CAMC CDC also takes special interest in the subject of this webinar. In 2019, 7% of registered, case, registered cases dealt with energy or or the oil and gas sector. In 2020, this number jumped to 17%. 30% of the arbitrations involving state entities in 2020 were also energy, energy or natural resources disputes. And those disputes I mentioned are highly complex. Half of these cases deals with multiple contracts or contractual networks. Campus CBC has also taken the lead in publicizing social initiatives against pandemics impacts worldwide. The goal is to broaden the network support for those who need the, for those who need it the most this time, at this time. Today, we would like to invite you to donate to an initiative that you are sure very much acquainted with, which is called Mulheres do Brasil, in English, Women of Brazil. The net, the, this is a network dedicated to fomenting affirmative action and to promote social justice through several projects that you can learn better in the QR code that you see on your screen right now. It goes without saying that your donation is highly necessary for the work of this wonderful organization. For those interests, please access the website page for more information or the QR code here in your screen. So without further ado, I'd like to briefly introduce our panel. First, Melida Hodgson, the head of General and Blocks, New York International Arbitration Practice. She is also a very experienced attorney and arbitrator in various matters. Noyana Marigo, a partner at Freshfields, head of the International Arbitration Group of the Americas and co-head of the Latin American Practice. She also acts as counsel and arbitrator in a variety of commercial and investment treaty arbitrations. Professor Patricia Saiz, uh, who's a faculty member at Esare Law School, where she teaches commercial and investment arbitration. In addition, she is a professor at the Geneva LLM and International Dispute Settlement and a lecturer at Columbia Law School, Business, Business Law Academy. She's also a regular guest speaker at Harvard Law and has very ex uh, his, his very experienced arbitrator and attorney. Felipe Esperangio is here in our panel representing Brazil, his, uh, although he's based in London. He's a the legal director at Klein and Co International Arbitration, has extensive uh, experience in complex arbitration, and also is a teaching associate at Queen Mary University of London. Last but not least, we have our moderator, Peter Sester. Peter is an active independent arbitrator and legal expert. He is a professor of Fundação Getúlio Vargas in Rio de Janeiro and author of various books. The intention today is to debate the topic in a very dynamic fashion. So I hope we, we, you enjoy what we have prepared for you. And if you have any questions along the way, please feel free to use the chat or the Q&A button. So Peter Sester, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ana Flavia, for the great preparation of the event and the opportunity. I also would like to thank my colleagues and the audience for being here with us today. It is here still morning, so good morning, Brazil. And I think good afternoon, uh, Barcelona, 
and London. What actually brings us together, oh, that's bad, uh, is a book that um, um, Gloria Alvarez, uh, Melanie Pichet, and Felipe Sperangio organized on energy and natural resource disputes in Latin America. And given the fact that I'm just an author and not the coordinator, I will um, stick to my very limited role and give the floor as soon as possible now to uh, Felipe. Please, Felipe, I, I hope you're not using a virtual background and can show the book. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Great. <laughs> Thank you, Peter. Thank you, Ana Flavia, for the kind introduction. And many thanks to Campus CBC for always supporting and creating a platform for intellectual discussions. It's not a coincidence that Campus CBC is a market leader in Latin America, both in services of managing cases and in hosting conferences and webinars. With respect to the book, Latin America is a region blessed with natural resources and full of opportunities, but it's also a region in which doing business requires special attention to local legal idiosyncrasies. The recent news coming from Ecuador illustrates the challenges that Latin America offers to players in the energy and natural resources project. Ecuador ratified the Exit Convention in 1986. In 2007, its government changed tax rules that allegedly conflicted with production contracts granted to foreign oil companies, giving rise to several investor state arbitrations against the country. As a result, in 2009, Ecuador withdrew from the Exit Convention. Fast forward a few years, a new government comes to power, starts settling the arbitration awards against the country, and a couple of weeks ago, Ecuador signs the Exceed Convention again. This pattern of alternating between governments with different stances towards foreign private investment has also be see been seen in Argentina, Brazil, and Mexico in the last decade. In Latin America, it is often the case that the political ideology will last until the next government comes to power with an opposing ideology. Political instability and changes in the legal framework, of course, lead to disputes and are factors to be carefully reviewed by anyone considering investing in the region. This book deals with a challenge like the one I have described. It is an ambitious attempt to cover the entire region, to address all relevant aspects related to energy projects from the regulatory framework, the inception of the contracts, up to enforcement of arbitration awards. It seeks to confront recurrent problems that, in our view, had not received the necessary attention, such as corruption or the displacement of indigenous tribes to clear space to mining pro projects. It deals with serious problems that urge immediate action such as climate change and energy transition. The authors are from Latin America or have extensively worked in the region. They are all experts in the topics allocated to them. And for our knowledge is the first book in English focus on energy and focus on Latin America. According to the statistics of ICSID and major international arbitration institutions, the energy sector is the biggest user of arbitration in the world. So we hope that the book will be useful to practitioners and academics. Thank you, Peter. Thank you, Felipe. 
uh, for your great introduction. And I will now uh, um, like to ask Patricia to briefly present her article. Patricia, you jumped in in the last moment. I'm very grateful for that. And uh, the floor is yours. Uh, muito obrigada. Uh, quero agradecer a CAM CCBC, a todos os organizadores pelo convite. Obrigada, Ana Flávia, Pedro, pela apresentação. É um prazer para mim estar aqui e poder passar uma manhã com vocês, mesmo, mesmo que seja em formato virtual. Como o tema já é suficientemente desafiador, eu passarei a conversa para o inglês, mas mesmo assim, queria dizer umas palavras em português, que é uma língua que eu amo. So, in this article, um, my co-author, Melanie Riofli, and I have focused specifically on the consequences of corruption in investment arbitration. And we chose the topic of corruption because, as Felipe mentioned, um, this is a pervasive practice. As we all know, uh, corruption has traditionally been perceived by many as a necessary evil for the successful conduct of business. And indeed, uh, numerous corporations, including Fortune 500 companies, have admitted to have made at some point dubious or illegal payments. And because the practice is unfortunately so pervasive, it is inevitable for corruption issues to arise in the context of arbitration proceedings, and in particular, in the case of our analysis in investment cases. We have observed that it is gradually becoming a regular occurrence for arbitral tribunals to deal with allegation, uh, allegations of corruption. And as a result, it is becoming recurrent in articles that analyze new cases um, as they come to light that these issues are addressed and therefore we wanted to uh, provide a general overview combining and analyzing the most relevant cases um, in the region. So I'd like to start by saying that numerous investment awards have dealt with allegations of corruption and the wide ranging legal issues left in its wake, although there are no clear legal standards yet for um, some of the issues that we address in the article. Uh, delving into the specifics of the content of the article, and in, in the article we touched upon a number of issues, um, but the, the bulk of the article is devoted to analyzing the context in which corruption allegations arise. And the mo the, there are two main areas where corruption allegations arise. The most common has to do with uh, the context of a state raising allegations of corruption as a shield, we call a shield as a defense uh, on jurisdiction so that it can get out of the proceedings. Um, uh, and, um, and here what we've actually looked at is whether an investment that was procured through bribery or corruption would retain the protections afforded by the applicable treaty. And I'll get back to this in a moment. The other issue that we've looked at where allegations of corruption come up is in the context of liability. And here we, we're looking at uh, allegations of corruption being used as a sword by the investor in order to um, allege that there was a violation of the standards of protection on the basis of, of, uh, of such allegations. So going back to the defense on jurisdiction, from a technical standpoint, I'm not gonna get into the specifics because the, I don't have a lot of time, but the, the issue is whether there is a legality requirement in investment protection treaties. Uh, and that is a requirement that the investment, this is how it's usually phrased, is made in accordance with the laws of the host state or a variation of this. So the question is, can, um, is an investment that was procured, for example, through corruption, will it be stripped of the protections of the treaty because it was not made in accordance with the laws of the host state? This legality requirement is oftentimes expressed. The parties to the treaty agree to it in express terms. Other, other times it's implied. And then there's a debate as to whether or not it applies in those cases. And without getting into the specifics, I would say a majority uh, concluded that no state can be understood to offer the benefit of protection through investment arbitration to investors that have committed an illegal act. There are other variations of this doctrine, the clean hands doctrine or general principles of good faith or the notion that um, every rule of law includes an implied clause that it should not be abused. So bottom line in the case of corruption because of the seriousness of the offense and because it's typically characterized as criminal activity, it is likely that a finding of evidence of corruption when making the investment uh, would potentially lead a tribunal to deny the protections afforded by the treaty. 
and that's on the basis of the the the, the awards that we have reviewed uh, for purposes of of this article. We've also analyzed, as I as I mentioned briefly earlier, um, another context in which uh, allegations of corruption arise, which is the the state's liability. And in this case, uh, investors will typically use corruption allegations, as I mentioned, as a sword, claiming that the host state has breached its obligations on the basis of the alleged act of corruption. And to give you an example, uh, tribunals have been asked to determine whether acts of extortion committed by a state agency followed by retaliation constituted a breach of the fair and equitable treatment standard. So this is the, the, the second big piece that we analyzed in the article. And then last but not least, uh, we addressed other issues more generally. We provided an overview of other corruption related issues, such as, for example, um, remember I mentioned that states often use allegations of corruption by the investor as a shield. Well, the question is, uh, may a state benefit from the misconduct of its own public officials who are usually involved in the corruption schemes to circumvent its international obligations? So there's a section on that. We've also talked about how proof of corruption is assessed. It's not an easy task in the case of, of corruption for many different reasons. Who has the burden of proof? How can it be met? What are the standards? Uh, we're a melting pot in arbitration. And so we all come from our different backgrounds, which leads to uh, different arbitrators applying different standards. And that shows in the, in the awards. Um, and we've also talked about other limitations that tribunals have, like the fact that a tribunal has limited ev evidentiary gathering powers, or the fact that there could be, uh, in running in parallel with an investment arbitration, there could be local proceedings, criminal, administrative, or civil, uh, that need to be taken into account and that complicate issues for arbitral tribunals. So um, I think I'm close to running out of time, but essentially in the article, we conclude that the case on corruption is still developing, that recent decisions have demonstrated that tribunals are increasingly willing to take these issues head on, and that as a result, the applicable standards are, and the criteria are in the process of being more precisely defined, not fully defined yet, which is a uh, a welcome development. É um tópico muito interessante, onde há muitas incógnitas e poucas respostas, e que certamente dará muito jogo nos próximos anos. Então, eu recomendo a vocês lerem o livro. Mais uma vez, muito obrigada pelo convite. Muitas graças, Patrícia. Uh, uh, my, my, my Spanish got a little bit rusty, but I actually started my Latin American experience more than 20 years ago in Buenos Aires. So uh, before moving on to, to Brazil, uh, we will come back to this issue and especially how to eventually uh, transpose this defense to a civil law jurisdiction uh, like Brazil that never was very ambitious in, to say it uh, smoothly, uh, to sign and ratify international treaties. And I would, I'm now very happy to, to hand over to Melida because she's going to speak about the type of project I really um, admire together because I'm a little bit a technical guy. So I really like uh, visiting mines and uh, steel mills. And in my previous life in Germany, I had uh, the opportunity to, to work a little bit on some mining projects. You might be surprised, but uh, there's a German state-owned bank, KFW, that used to be quite active in mining business. And, uh, I, and, and if you have ever seen a mine, you will immediately understand why this is a problem of, uh, of environmental issues and uh, also uh, uh, human rights. So Melida, please uh, go ahead. Thank you. Thank you very much. And I, I, it's hard to follow Patricia as always, but uh, I'll just say I think molto obrigada. And that's I'm going to stick to English for the rest of this because I do not speak Portuguese. Um, and let me just say it's it's an honor to and a pleasure to be invited by uh, CAM CCDC to participate in this this panel today. It's also a privilege to be with old friends uh, Patricia. Mayana and newish friends, I'll call you uh, Felipe and, and Peter. And of course, I have to give thanks to, to, to Gloria Alvarez, uh, to Melanie Rio Frio, to Felipe for having invited me to participate in the book. Uh, and, and last but not least is, is thanks to my colleague uh, and associate Paulo Garrido Cardoso, who um, 
uh, helped write a lot of it, as I'm sure you, you can imagine. Um, it, you know, our article was sort of charged with describing the, the waterfront, in, in essence, of Latin American state entities or Latin American uh, states as actors in, in uh, energy and mining disputes. Um, so we first looked at the different policy approaches that states have taken in terms of promoting uh, and also regulating investment in, in the uh, oil and gas and the mining sector. Uh, and of course, the only natural conclusion is that it was very diverse. Uh, there was no other conclusion to come to. Um, and with apologies, because I, I will not speak a lot about Brazil, uh, and that's largely because we don't necessarily have uh, a lot of uh, jurisprudence to look at, because of course, uh, Brazil has not participated in investment um, arbitrations, which means uh, we don't have access to a lot of the the cases, but certainly I'm aware that uh, there, are, there is a very healthy commercial arbitration uh, community uh, in Brazil that deals with some of these issues also. Um, in, in looking at um, the, the foreign investment and, and regulation, uh, one of the factors that we found that was interesting is, is when and how much a state has actively participated in the sector, that is as a competitor, let's say, of uh, an investor, of a foreign investor, uh, or a domestic investor for that matter. Uh, so you might have, you know, we've had, we've seen reforms in Mexico over the course of time where it, it opened up uh, about, I guess, six, seven years ago, its energy sector, uh, and possibly during the current uh, administration, uh, um, you know, it was mentioned that oftentimes these things go, uh, in looking at the example of Ecuador, they depend on who is uh, the leader of the country. And so we've seen a little bit of uh, pushback now from the current uh, government in Mexico, which is interesting also in the context of the um, the, the latest investment uh, protection provisions that it signed on to in the USMCA, and I'll touch on that a, a little bit later. But it, in looking at whether or not the state has sort of remained an actor or has essentially said, um, we're open for business, come on in. It, and I, I, for that example, I would use Peru, which has had a lot of uh, commercial arbitration, but also as we've seen, and as is mentioned, what will happen is you will end up having both uh, commercial arbitration disputes as well as uh, investment disputes. And I, I think in some ways the, the mining sector uh, lends itself to that because you're looking at contracts, but you're also looking at the possibility that states acting as states uh, will in terms of regulating, in terms of permitting, um, end up uh, with issues with uh, in investors. Um, so, you know, one um, uh, factor in, in this is, as, as Peter mentioned, obviously, is the issue of uh, environmental uh, and uh, human rights, human rights writ large, what I will call sort of social cultural um, obligations. In, in mining, you will have, um, uh, whether it be a contractual obligation to, um, First, to ensure that, well, it, to varying degrees, you may be obligated, obviously, to obtain from the government a mining permit. Uh, but that then involves also, based on a fairly large environmental impact study, uh, establishing relations with communities that are around you, uh, establishing uh, ways to support those communities, both in terms of education, in terms of health, uh, and also in terms of ensuring that they're aware of how the project develops. Quite frankly, I think we've seen sort of not the best examples of uh, investor behavior in, in, in this context. Um, and then the other side of it, so I, I'll call that the sort of social cultural obligations, which are now by some NGOs being more specifically defined within a human rights context. And then you have the, um, environmental aspect, uh, which is, you know, as, as Peter says, uh, I, I have been at a couple of mines and it is uh, fascinating and interesting. And you see that, you know, mines 
normally involve removal of huge amounts of land, uh, of earth, and uh, that obviously affects the communities around. It affects the ground, the stability of the ground. Uh, it affects uh, water passage, the movement of water. Sometimes streams or bigger than streams, rivers have to be diverted in order to accommodate a project. You can see that all of this has a huge impact on the people that are in the surrounding communities. And so there is that environmental impact, what I'll call a local environmental impact. And then there's a larger environmental impact overall from a sort of state's policy in the way it's going to deal with, um, you know, if you've got a mining project here and a mining project there, what do you, you know, what, what, what are the ultimate impacts overall on, on your, as a state um, uh, environmental uh, situation? And also, uh, as we move into a world where states are supposed to be improving their, um, uh, let's say, their, their care of the world, the world environmental situation, you know, how does it impact their ability to comply with, with, with Paris Accord obligations? Pretty much every state, you know, it's the kind of thing that, well, except for the United States for a while, it's the kind of thing that most states have signed on to and thought was important to do. And of course, we're, we're happy that the United States has uh, rejoined um, or is, is taking the steps to rejoin the Paris Accords. Um, so it, as you can see what happens, it's sort of a, it's really a perfect storm, but the, the issues that can sort of come to clash um, are, are there. And I, I think we've seen varying um, treatments by tribunals of, of these issues, but I think more and more as there is just frankly awareness um, of, of these issues, we will see that um, tribunals will have to, to deal with these issues head on. And, and one of the ways to do it, I think it's, it's, it's fairly difficult if you've got a back and forth uh, situation with an investor, for example, where they're not getting a permit. Um, uh, and maybe people said they would get a permit or you know, the local officials said yes, the national officials said no. All of these things lead to not usually the best circumstances for uh, uh, states in terms of defending against these kinds of claims. I mean, unless you really got evidence of you know, a gross pollution violation, uh, it's going to be, I think, a tough case. But we're starting to see tribunals deal with, with the behavior, contributory behavior, let's call it, of investors in, in different ways. And um, I'll stop there because I think Moyana has uh, something more, more interesting to talk about uh, when you look at how tribunals uh, deal with this, even if they find that states are responsible from a liability perspective, they do uh, are, are starting to look at a number of factors um, that affect the ultimate outcome. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um... Before I hand over the floor to Noyana, I would like to say a few things, a short introduction because her uh, topic is extremely interesting, but also very specific because it builds on discounted cash flow. And I would like to, because my topic in the book is on project finance and gas uh, offtake agreements, let me say a few words on it. Um, the, the characteristic of, of energy projects, of mining especially, and uh, oil and gas also both of all these projects are long term very long term so they are very much exposed to political changes political risk over time and um, uh, when they are structured uh, they are basically just a a bundle of of, of contracts and um, but in order to get finance for these projects it's important to calculate the future cash flow because project finance lending is cash, is cash flow based lending. And the most important contracts that define the future cash flow of a project are obviously the concession agreement due to the royalty obligations, the offtake agreement uh, with an offtaker that purchases over a long period of time uh, the energy, the crude oil, the steel, the iron ore, whatever is produced. And um, of course, uh, the fin financing documents. And the challenge of, of uh, calculating uh, the cash flow, the future cash flow of the company, 
is that you don't have any cash flow yet. So it's it's not like uh, purchasing um, um, a closely held corporation or even a publicly held corporation when you can use either the a market price of the shares, or at least you can look at EBITDA and calculate and make a cash flow projections. You are, you are actually in project finance rely on the contractual clauses and the stability of the contracts. And then when eventually the project fails, and this brings us to the topic of Noyana then, and uh, the contractor um, or the mining company or the energy company, uh, claims damages, uh, you have um, a difficult issue to calculate these damages eventually. And now I think uh, uh, I can hand over to you and uh, please explain your article. Thank, thank you, Peter. And thank you uh, to the organizers of Council CDC for the invitation and also for the invitation to write the book it was an interesting exercise. And I warn everyone, my Topic, it's a little bit dry for some lawyers, but I will tell you why I came to the idea of writing about damages in, in arbitration with a focus on energy projects in Latin America. In my prior life before becoming um, a lawyer in the arbitration field, I worked in banking and project finance. So I was always very interested in these issues of valuation and how you calculate the value of a company. And, and then when you get to, the arbitration part, and then you have to tell the tribunal how much this project um, was worth. Um, I started realizing that not many tribunals really understand the valuation methodologies. So I started reviewing most of the awards and and I'm of course generalizing, but many times I got frustrated by the lack of explanation of the reasoning why you would get to certain discount rate or applying certain methodology and sometimes even um, not addressing most of the, of the topics. And I have seen awards where you have, okay, party A say five, party B say 10, then it's 750. Um, so I thought um, a lot has to do with lawyers not really feeling comfortable with the technicalities of how you do valuation because it's not law. And so what I did is I spent a lot of time trying to uh, learn more of the technical aspects. And I thought it was going to be a good idea to put it in a very summarized way. It's, it's a short and quite concise uh, article. But the idea was to summarize all of the main valuation uh, methodologies that we have today and that are used in energy projects. Look at when do you use them, match them with the legal theory, either if you are in a contractual case or if you are in a BAT case, what's the legal theory behind, what's the type of project that you have? Do you have a history of operation? Don't you have, do you have similar transactions that have happened in the market? So I went through every single methodology of the main, the ones that are used um, by, by tribunals and tried to explain it in simple uh, terms for uh, lawyers who might be interested in understanding a little bit more. And for me, the motivation was really to be able to work with the evaluation experts and be able to challenge them with a certain level of authority. And one, once I, I was there, I felt like really, really proud. So this article, I wrote it with, not with another lawyer, but with someone who does um, valuation. And that when you read the article, you're gonna see is, is quite technical in, in certain aspects. But then we also analyze how the tribunals were looking at those issues. Uh, we dedicated quite a lot of time at the issue of discount rate and DCF. First, because it's one of the main methodologies that we see today in, in damage valuation, particularly in, in, in projects with history of operations, and we will talk about that a little bit later. Uh, but also because you have to look at several variables and depending on the type of energy project that you have, some things might become more or less relevant. Um, in the DCF, we dedicate a lot of time to discuss the discount rate, particularly because when you look at the awards, they're all over the place. And most of the time, it's not even the fault of the tribunal, it's even the fault of the parties and how they, how they presented the case. So one of the, the learnings that I have from, from doing this review is when you present a case, um, 
when you go back to the cases and quote them, be very careful because sometimes the decisions don't either don't follow a logic or a reasoning, but many times it's just they are choosing one party that put forward a more uh, reasonable position without being it really the one that is technically correct. So you need to do a little bit of homework if you're gonna be relying on, on, on prior cases. Um, and just to end, um, after going through um, the particularities of the, of the valuation methodology, depending on whether you are looking at a, a, a mining project, at a oil and gas project, um, uh, public services like energy, electricity, gas distribution, which also are have their particularities because they have, a, as Peter was saying, long-term contracts with very regulated um, frameworks and it's quite easy to use for DCS because you have a more or less certain um, level of um, uh, future stream of, of income and that, that makes it, it quite easier to, to work with DCF. And at the end, we just dedicate a little bit of time to the issue of interest because as well, when you look at the awards, uh, tribunals are going a little bit all over the place. And sometimes it's difficult to find a common understanding of what's um, the theory behind interest and then what would be the best um, interest rate uh, depending on the project that you have and, and the time that has passed. So I hope people are gonna enjoy it and uh, it, it, it's, as I was saying, it's not the typical language that you see in, in legal articles, but I think it's, it's quite useful at least to have a, a quick understanding on what are the best, um, the best methodologies to, to present your, your valuation case, basically. Thank you very much. Maybe I would like to add just one thing for our audience. What actually um, discounted method means I mean, if you look at an income stream over time, over 10 or 15 years, you will receive this money from today's perspective in different periods of time. So then if you claim damages because you are going to lose this income stream in the future, you cannot simply sum up the future payments. You have to discount them to have to reduce them to the present moment. And to do so, it's, you re first, because you will receive if you have a damage claim and if there's liquidity, you will re receive this money immediately. So you wipe out the risk that in the future you are not going to get it. And secondly, you can of course apply the money that you receive now as damages uh, and gain interest. So you have to apply a discount interest rate uh, to the sim so simply the sum of the future payments. And that is actually, uh, I think, the, the essence and defining that interest rate is a very difficult task, which includes, first of all, that you have not to wait for the money to flow in anymore. And second, that there is no risk anymore because the future money is always also uncertain. Well, that said, and because I'm, I'm still uh, very fascinated by the financing side, which I worked on many years and because also I'm an economist. So I, would, I was very thrilled by an award that was published last year in August, I think, a partial award. Unfortunately, it was not published, I'm wrong, but there's some rumors on that award um, came to, to the international arbitration community. And the case refers to a project financing in Spain, in the south of Spain. And uh, the, the investors that are involved are basically German investors because uh, at the time when the Sp Spanish government promoted green energy uh, with very favorable tariff regimes at the beginning of the century before the huge financial crisis of Spain. And as you might know, Germans are very enthusiastic for, for green energy. And the Germans also have a very uh, interesting um, fund structure, uh, which allows investors uh, to benefit from depreciations and uh, uh, from uh, directly from gains uh, that are related to that were related to this, uh, this, ta this, this tariff regime. Uh, and this led in as a consequence to the fact that closed end funds financed a lot of wind farm uh, solar farm energy projects in the south 
of Spain, Andalusia, where you have sun different from Germany. And, uh, but then uh, the tariffs got at least uh, over time for uh, the Spanish government, particularly in, in the financial crisis, uh, too expensive. And um, as far as I remember, the Spanish government in two steps changed uh, the regulatory regime, the, the tariffs, and um, this led to a, hu a huge number of um, um, investment arbitrations. I think today Spain is almost competing with Argentina in terms of uh, the, uh, the, the most uh, investment arbitrations, basically due to this issue. And, um, and very interesting uh, uh, is that, uh, as far as understood, uh, in this Portugal case, uh, an investment arbitral tribunal in a partial award considered uh, the engagement uh, of the debt capital providers as an investment in the sense of uh, the energy charter treaty, or at least in terms of, of jurisdiction. It's, it's a little bit unclear. Maybe you can, have, uh, can say a few words on that before sure. I ask. Sure, and it's a, it's a very important question because as, as Peter was saying, and most of you know, when we're talking about energy projects, that financing is critical. That most people don't finance these enormous projects with equity only. And I was looking at some of the numbers and in the energy sector alone, uh, project finance transactions closed in 2019, no, not yet last year, 2019 amounted to 11 billion in Latin America alone. And if you look at globally it was 85 billion. So most of the capital that is flowing to the region and globally comes from debt holders. Um, and when you look at what the debt holders are doing, actually they are also assuming in project finance, uh, all of the commercial and investment risk, the same ones that, that the equity holders and, or even more because uh, sometimes they have more um, skin in the game um, and also are, are basically at the mercy of certain regulatory measures by, by the state. For reasons that I, I, I don't really understand in the case law, or basically is how the cases were presented, there was this um, concept that debt holders didn't have the same protection as equity holders, that, that not always was debt considered investment. And it's true there are some BITs that exclude debt as an investment, but there are many others that are, have like very wide definitions on the investment and really the legal reasoning, at least for me, didn't follow that they shouldn't have the same protection as um, equity holders. But as Peters was saying, uh, I think 2019, we have the, the opportunity to test again um, this concept because with the crisis in Spain, many of the project finance or the banks decided to, to sue Spain and one of the cases I, uh, my firm was involved is the Portugal versus Spain case. And again, as Peter was saying, this is only a jurisdictional question at the moment. We're gonna be waiting for the decision on the merits and also on how do you calculate the value of the debt and how you, um, what's the real loss there because the value over time also increased increase value. So there are issues on, on, on date of valuation that are very interesting. But basically what the tribunal said is, um, if you look at the project and the project is, or the, the debt is uh, closely aligned with the project. So all of the money is going to develop the project. It's not going for other commercial uses. That uh, debt is basically considered a protected investment under the treaty in that case uh, was the energy charter. Um, in that case, 80% of the project in the Portagon case was uh, debt and only 20 was equity, equity. So it was very important that, um, that, that the tribunal considered that it was covered. And what is important as well is in this case, what the tribunal was looking at is whether the measures were directed to the project and not to the debt. 
because there had been some cases where, I don't know, there was a certain regulation that didn't allow the banks to collect debt. Well, that, that's a measure directly, directly linked to the debt and it was easier to pass through the jurisdictional test. But what was a little bit new in this case that the tribunal looked at uh, measures that were directed to the project and not to the debt. Um, what is important is that the tribunal looked at it said it has to be reasonably closely connected to the investment. And this brings, and I, I don't want to take too much time, but some things are start being important to think when you put a project into place and when you start working in setting up the project as a bank or a lender, start looking at the way you paper your contracts. Start looking at, okay, are you receiving, are you relying on the tariff regime as one of the main premises for your investment? Uh, can you have meetings with the government? So make sure when you set up the project, you establish already that link during your, your due diligence, that your, your, your due diligence is not only related to technical aspects, but also to the reliance on, on, on the tariff regime and, and all of the guarantee, legal guarantees that, that you have as a debtor. So I think that's going to be a, a, an important uh, lesson from this case. And, and I can see already banks looking at this decision and trying to adapt a little bit their practices to make sure in the future they're very prepared. Yeah, thank you so much. I just uh, would like to use this opportunity to comment on a new uh, recently adopted law on public procurement uh, in Brazil, uh, which does not only regulate public procurement, but also contracts with the public administration. And despite the fact that the current government is, is, is causing a lot of distortion on the international level, they are adopting some specific laws that are very favorable to risk allocation and to Pacta Sunt Servanda, which, which was over many years in Brazil not taken so serious in civil law doctrine. And the new public procurement law in Article 103 explicitly permits to a detailed uh, risk allocation matrix clause and such clauses, such a clause, if the conditions are satisfied, uh, is a very good defense against uh, attempts of the government or the, the public administration that is parties to such concession contract or uh, another type of administrative contract to claim decrease or, or increase at the price clause. So I think we're going to have in Brazil also more sophisticated contracts to deal with this issue of attempts of, of uh, if changing winds in politics uh, or if simply treasury needs uh, call contract revisions uh, to, to, to build a, a strong case against that. Uh, before coming back to corruption, I would now like to take the opportunity to ask uh, how she's uh, seeing uh, the impact or the future of, of new bilateral investment treaty models um, in, in Latin America in particular. Thank you, Peter. Um, I think it's very interesting, it's fascinating because we're seeing the movement away perhaps from the sort of regional efforts to create a regional framework. We know of course that there are um, negotiations uh, on, on, that are currently uh, at UNCITRAL and working group three that govern really only the um, dispute settlement uh, part of uh, the, the concerns about investment arbitration. Um, and so what's going on in working group three will cover procedure in essence. And obviously it, the procedure is very important, but I think there are many who still feel that um, issues that need to be dealt with are really have to do with the substantive provisions. So we've seen sort of different um, really, Latin American states have been doing very different things, sometimes all at the same time. So, uh, you know, you have Chile, uh, Peru, and Mexico are part of the um, uh, Trans-Pacific Agreement, the CPTPP, 
uh, which has a number of provisions that um, were interesting, a number of changes that were interesting. Uh, I, I think one that I would highlight is um, the uh, fair and equitable treatment provision uh, where there's some direction to tribunals that um, having expectations does not necessarily uh, equate with there being a violation of the fair and equitable treatment provision if your expectations are frustrated. Um, this is, of course, because originally this treaty was very much modeled on the US uh, model, uh, which comes from after the NAFTA reform um, uh, you know, the treat, the, the model bit that the United States established in 2004 and since then, which sort of seeks to emphasize that the obligations that the states are taking on are obligations that are linked to um, obligations uh, under customary international law and therefore narrower obligations or, or, or heightened standards, let's say, um, it being required. Uh, from that <laughs> sort of CPTPP model, uh, and obviously some of these countries are also negotiating with um, the EU, uh, which is um, interestingly uh, sort of having some provisions that are, are similar in, in the sense of seeking to more, more narrowly define provisions that previously were, you know, a seven seven word sentence. Um, and, and that's new for Europe in, in a sense. And I, and I think it's born out of the fact that several European states have now faced, um, not just Spain, but have faced investment arbitrations. Um, what we also see is um, the Mexico, for example. So again, Mexico is part of CPTPP. Mexico is negotiating with other, other countries. And we see the reform of the NAFTA in which, in essence, uh, it will only have investment arbitration between Mexico or really for US investors in Mexico. Um, and we see there a tiering or a um, TIER, um, a, a sort of grading of investors, which of course has caused a lot of uh, concern or discord in, in the United States. But Mexico has signed onto this because, of course, it's linked to the reforms that were that were enacted in, in the in 2014, 2013, but that now were sort of apparently possibly threatened in the energy sector. Uh, and so we see that for some investors, those kinds of investors, I would say energy investors, though they'll be protected, I would say, at the highest level. And then you have a lower level other kinds of investors, let's call them, uh, who really will lose the benefits of um, certain MFN provisions, uh, uh, very narrow, other very narrow restrictions. And so it, it's interesting and one wonders whether this is the way forward for some states that have been uh, very concerned about the impact um, on uh, the impact of investment arbitration specifically. Uh, and then you have the Brazil example, which of course is, is this cooperation framework agreement where there is no investment arbitration still. Uh, it's, it's sort of, you're getting closer to it, but uh, the idea is to sort of try to work things out essentially, um, at, if not initially with the investor, then certainly at a state level. So it's really a very diverse uh, approach um, to, and, and one tailored, I think, state by state. And I think one of the um, outcomes, let's say, of the, the legitimacy, legitimacy crisis of investment arbitration is that it's probably allowing states to more closely tailor their own needs and not just be sort of receptors and, and acceptors of what um, a, a bigger figure like a US or, or an EU says, you know, here's this treaty, sign it. In essence, it really does allow, hopefully, for, for more assertion on the part of some of the states that there are certain things in Latin states in Latin America, that there are certain things that they can accept and there are certain things that they won't accept. And obviously, at the end of all of that is what is their true economic interest. Thank you so much. Uh, well, as, as, as I previously said, as I previously said, Brazil um, 
right signed in the 90s um, when Argentina signed and ratified, for instance, BITs on recommendation of the International Monetary Fund, some BITs, but never ratified it. And we are now moving to this new model. And eventually, I hope, as you said, it's an intermediate step to, to really join the, the international model, because I think for a private investor, it's, these models are very difficult to value, let's say, because you need to motivate your government to take action. And that is especially what banks don't like. Uh, so from the financier side, I, I, I see some issues here in the effectiveness. Before coming back to this and, 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 and Philippe, I would like to ask a question that is for us in Brazil, very important to Patricia and it's uh, unfortunately corruption. We had uh, an epic corruption scandal that is still occupying like the diesel scandal uh, in, in Germany and worldwide uh, law firms that are increasing uh, their revenues to this scandal significantly. Uh, we have here the same story about uh, car wash, which will occupy us in, in arbitrations and in all kinds of levels for another 10 years at least. And now it's coming up uh, a new scandal maybe not of the same size in terms of money, but uh, in terms of impact on society about vaccination, um, acquisition of vaccines. And uh, I would like to ask Patricia, what, how, how, how does it work in practice to, to, to prove corruption allegations? And what are the, the hurdles for the arbitral tribunal to, to make, uh, to take a, a really essential uh, stance on, on, on the question of corruption. Uh, thank you, Peter. Um, there are a number of hurdles that tribunals face when, when dealing with corruption allegations. Um, obviously, uh, the first one that comes to mind is that uh, corruption, as we've discussed earlier, uh, could have severe consequences, and yet the tribunal lacks the investigative powers uh, and tools um, and uh, cannot order the disclosure of bank secrets or um, execute search warrants or conduct surveillance. And so tribunals are limited uh, to the evidentiary record that is put before them by, by the parties. So, so that I would say that's, um, th that's limitation number one. Another thing to consider is when we're sitting as arbitrators and we uh, have a suspicion of corruption or an allegation of corruption is raised, do we have a duty to report? That's something else that, that arbitrators have to deal with. In many jurisdictions, um, arbitrators or really any person who comes into knowledge of the commission of a crime is obligated to report it to the public authorities. Um, so, what is an arbitrator to do about it? And how do you reconcile that with the duty of confidentiality? Um, so that's another issue, just to give you an example. In Spain, uh, the obligation exists, um, unmitigated, but the consequences of it are a pecuniary fine in the amount of something between half a euro and, uh, and 1.75 euros. So, this is a jurisdiction by jurisdiction analysis, but it's it's uh, it's a concern, right? What what to do with with um, with the allegations once they are put before us? Um, then there's the issue, as I mentioned earlier, of parallel criminal proceedings. Um, when there is a parallel criminal administrative investigation dealing with um, allegations of corruptions that could impact directly the result of the arbitration. What is the tribunal supposed to do about it? Um, are you supposed to stay the proceedings? Are you supposed to continue the proceedings? What if this is a dilatory tactic? Um, there's a recent decision of the Madrid uh, High Court uh, uh, annulling an award on the basis that the tribunal, this is in a commercial case, uh, when faced with evidence of criminality that affected the impact of the proceedings in the arbitration, did not um, stay the proceedings. And the instruction is to stay the proceedings, to continue up until the moment of issuing the award and at that point staying the proceedings. That, of course, 
can go either way, right? Because then this could be used as a dilatory tactic. Um, uh, and so that's, that's another concern. What if in a, in a particular proceeding, uh, the tribunal ends up not finding enough evidence of corruption, but then a court subsequently concludes there is evidence of corruption and what is the effect of that on the award and what are the implications for purposes of annulment or recognition and enforcement of the award um, and, and uh, on, on different grounds. I'm thinking particularly on public policy issues. So all of these issues are there. Then there's the issue of, of course, <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm doing a laundry list of all the difficulties. It's a fun exercise, I have to say, but, but um, it's just for completion um, and things that we've touched upon in, in, in the article, the assessment of proof of corruption. Obviously, there's little evidence of corruption uh, in general. It's very unusual, like uh, it happened in, in, in one particular case where one of your witnesses is going to say, yes, I bribed the president of country X and I paid two million so that I could develop this airport. So that's very unusual. So how, how do you go about it? What are the different standards that will apply? I mentioned this earlier, we're all coming from different jurisdictions and we bring with us our, our background. And so there are inconsistent positions in the awards with respect to the standard uh, that should be applied to corruption. Some awards have applied a clear and convincing standard, which is a higher standard than preponderance of the evidence, for example. Others have applied reasonable certainty. Others have applied preponderance of the evidence. So how do we reconcile all that? And, and I go back to one of the comments I made, which is that luckily we are in the direction where people are addressing these issues. And, and hopefully within a few years, we'll get to some, some sort of consistency with respect to, um, to some of these, of these matters. So that's just a, a small overview of some of the difficulties that arbitrators face when dealing with corruption allegations. I think you're on mute. <laughs> uh, thank you so much. Felipe, you had a long break, but now it's yours. Uh, do you think uh, actually that Brazil would benefit from ratifying the exit convention and BITs, and why do you think do you think uh, it was in the last twenty years never seriously considered to do so? Peter, I understand that that boat has sailed. Um, None of the governments that have been in power in the last decades have shown any political will to sign the exit convention. There was appetite for BATs in the 90s from the federal government, as you mentioned, but uh, they failed to go through in the Congress and Senate. Would Brazil receive more FDI if it ratifies the exit convention? It would, almost certainly, but how higher would be that level of FDI? And that's a tricky question. It's arguably impossible to, to measure the precise impact of joining the city convention on the levels of FDI into a country. Many competent professionals have conducted empirical research but to my knowledge, there has been no conclusive bulletproof report on the precise correlation between exceed or BITs and FDI. It is a difficult task between, because many factors compete simultaneously in the decision process of the foreign investor. For example, a country began to offer investor state dispute settlement, and at the same time, its currency devaluated. The level of FDI increased because the assurance that the government has given to resolve disputes or because it simply became cheaper to invest in that country. Or if the return in the develop, developed countries are at record lows, maybe the risk of putting money in a country without investor state dispute settlement does not sound that risky anymore. 
what I think Brazil should do, and uh, it's where the arbitration community should engage, is to focus on preserving the flexibility and the for autonomy in the commercial arbitrations involving foreign investors and the Brazilian public entities. Because that's the only offer in the menu to foreign investors or domestic investors. The Brazilian model to resolve dispute is simply and only based on commercial arbitration, which is not even international arbitration, because there are many conditions applicable to the mechanism to resolve disputes when a public entity is involved. Um, my research for the book identified about 20 laws addressing arbitration with public entities in Brazil, all of which add conditions and rest restrictions to party autonomy of, that is afforded in the Brazilian Arbitration Act. My view is a necessary from, from a legal perspective and, and a helpful from a commercial pers perspective to overregulate commercial arbitration involving the public entities in Brazil. There is a correlation between the level of the ease of doing business and the level of investment in a country. The constant addition of laws and conditions creates a complex legal framework for the foreign investor to, to navigate. And overregulated markets attract fewer players. The focus, in my opinion, should be on offering a streamlined legal framework, which reduces transaction costs and creates an incentive to invest. Also, full party autonomy should be treated as an asset for by the, the Brazilian entities because since they control the drafting of the contracts that are offered in the concession agreements to the domestic and foreign investors, the Brazilian public entities would benefit from the possibility of adjusting its contractual position according to each transaction or project. In times of economic downturn, as we're facing now in Brazil, the government needs to convince foreigners to bring money into the country. And for example, agreeing the seat of the arbitration abroad could attract more investors or could reduce the, the transaction cost. And we have been seeing that many laws, recent laws, which regulate specific energy and natural resource sectors or that regulate the contracts in which the public entities enter to, such as concession agreements or public-private partnerships, all those laws provide for, for seat of the arbitration in Brazil. The seat is obviously highly relevant because the national courts of the seat have jurisdiction to decide the challenge to an award. So to answer your question, Peter, it seems that the big seat debate is a moot exercise in Brazil right now. And the academic community should work to demonstrate to legislators the benefit of a flexible and streamlined legal framework for arbitration in which for autonomy is the ultimate, ultimate goal, utmost goal, and also a selling point to investors. Thank you, Felipe. I, I can only fully agree with you. Let me uh, tell a short anecdote. A couple of years ago, I was invited by a regional uh, arbitration chamber to Belo Horizonte to talk about uh, investment arbitration and to talk about arbitrations involving the public administration. I have to admit, I, I, I made the final preparation on the flight when I started to read this state law of Minas Gerais on arbitrations involving the public administration. And I stepped over a clause that is really astonishing. It's not only that it's Brazilian law, the seat must be in Belo Horizonte, it's Portuguese language. You also must be, as an arbitrator, a resident of Minas Gerais. 
And I said to myself on the phone, my, my God, what I'm doing here, I will never have an appointment as an arbitrator in Minas Gerais because I'm, I'm not ready to move there, although I like very much the city. So I think uh, that, that is really uh, too much. And uh, I think from an, uh, from an investor's perspective, and that is really something that uh, would be, uh, I think that Brazil must improve over time to attract more investors. One should know that if you have a domestic arbitration, and this is increasingly becoming a problem, uh, unfortunately, we do not have um, annulment proceedings like, uh, like in, in, in arbitration, in classical arbitration countries. You enter with a challenge in the first instance, in the court of first instance. This court, if you are lucky and you are in Sao Paulo, where you have very, very qualified judges, uh, you will have uh, a decision after one year, one and a half years. Then you go for appeal, also in Sao Paulo, another one and a half years. So we already have three or four years. And then you have, it's very easy, actually, all big ticket arbitrations can end up at the STJ. You can have um a third instance and then this means you have between five six seven years until you will really know if the challenge against your commercial arbitration award is successful or not it's clear from the outset that if if these all and this applies to partial awards so imagine you have a huge m a transaction the partial award is annulled in the first instance the final award not even uh, rendered and you you litigate six six years in the courts i mean um but the the alternative is you have a foreign award which needs to be uh which needs exequatur of the stj but it goes straight to the stj if it's contested it might take three four years eventually um like in the abengoa case uh, if it's not contested, it's very it's a very fast process. So I think here we have a certain imbalance. I, I, I really don't see that the government will ratify the exit convention, unfortunately, maybe. But uh, I think uh, the, the, the alternative that the state offers is not perfect. It's also not perfect, and this is something that might be very interesting for uh, foreign investors. Even if you have an award, even if the award is not annulled, it's very difficult to exec execute this award because you actually you cannot uh, execute it in, in, in a normal way. You will have a kind of title called precatoria, and you have to register this precatoria in the debt register register of the public administration that lost arbitration. And then you have to wait eventually years until this unit will pay. You can sometimes trade it on a secondary market at a deep discount to its face value, but it's, uh, it's, it's not really something uh, very attractive. And, and I think we we really must work on this to, to capture foreign investment. And due to our um, financial constraints, we will depend on that. And, and that may be before I come back to the round, my last uh, comment on, on the current situation. The Brazilian government is in, in a difficult process, but uh, it is about to privatize one of the last very huge uh, public state enterprises, the Eletropras, by means of a capital increase to dilute uh, the uh, controlling majority of the state. Electropass is already a listed corporation and uh, the, the state uh, will issue, the company will issue new shares. Uh, the, com the government, the federal government will not make use of its preferential rights. So it's controlling uh, stake will disappear will go down first to 40% and maybe later uh, even lower. And I think this will tremendously in the medium run impact uh, the energy market because it will open uh, doors for new competitors. We have already regarding the distribution networks, we already have state grid as 
the major player and no longer national players, we will have in the construction sector the need to have far more um, foreign companies. So I think uh, there's plenty of, of room for investments and uh, I hope we can attract them. And um, maybe that was not on my script here, but I, I had a, an idea came up to my mind when we were discussing about Spain, particularly, and I would like to know how you see this on a worldwide scale and especially towards Latin America. Do you think the, the approach of the, the European Court of Justice towards the Energy Charter Treaty and the ITs and the whole development we see now in Europe will impact investment arbitration worldwide and in Latin America or will it remain just a European, European um, problem or issue? What do you think, Patricia? You're very close to this development, I think. It's a good question, and it's hard to, to, uh, to, to, to make a prediction as to, as to what's going to happen. I mean, I think the, it has already had effects. The, I, I would say the, uh, the ripple effects and, and some of the legitimacy crisis that we're seeing um, arises in part out of, out of the issues that we're seeing in intra-EU EU bits. So it's hard, again, I wouldn't, make, I wouldn't make predictions. I think the, I, I think, I think uh, for countries outside of the EU to try to circumvent their international obligations, they would have to come up with very creative theories. Um, and, and, and I cannot anticipate, uh, as of today, I cannot anticipate how, how they would do that. What's your opinion? Thank you. What's your opinion, Noyana? No, it's a little bit the same as Patricia is saying. I, I think it will have an impact. We already see at an international level, all of these groups are analyzing the future of investment arbitration. Um, you, you can see it in, in the air, you can see it in the negotiations of the new treaties. And even the, the new way that um, uh, Mel, Mel, uh, Melida was describing, I, I, I had to do several legal opinions in the last couple of months with these treaties, and it's really, they're really complex, and it's really difficult um, to predict how tribunals are going to deal with them. And you can see that there are limitations compared to the prior treaties. So, the more um, I think we we advance in negotiation of the new treaties, the more of all these elements will come into place. I don't know what the final result it is, but we're going way much more to the middle and. There are some elements like the European court. I don't know what, where we're gonna end up with all that. Thank you, Emelida. And what is your opinion? Do you think it will have a boost or will we see a shift to, to commercial arbitration used by states or? Well, I, I think it's an interesting contradiction because um, <clears throat> I agree with what Mayana and Patricia have said, which is that we've already seen an impact. I, I think some states <clears throat> may feel more um, liberated to ask their uh, partners, their state partners, contracting partners to be um, more uh, restrictive, perhaps, in some of these treaties, because after all, the countries that sort of set the models and set the very liberal models have now turned around and said, oh, we want um, more uh, restrictive uh, provisions. And we're, you know, they're going to abide by, obviously, they have to abide by what the, the European Court of Justice says uh, within the European framework. But so if you're going to have um, uh, you know, the Dutch coming up with a model that, that is possibly the most restrictive uh, model in terms of requirements on investors, in terms of uh, exceptions, in terms of directions to, to the limiting certain substantive provisions, then, you know, there's no reason for other countries, Latin American countries, not to want to have that. The, the interesting thing, I, I think, the, the contradiction is that um, you're right, a lot of Latin American states that I've spoken with, and a lot, a couple of Latin American states that I've spoken uh, to, 
are interested in, in having more disputes be on the commercial, uh, under the, the rubric of a commercial dispute. Um, so even if it's at uh, exit or, or moving out of the situation where you have contract disputes at exit to ICC or, or, or another venue, um, I, I say it's an interesting contradiction because at the same time that these states are fighting for transparency in investment arbitration, for example, at Uncentral uh, and working group three, they're sort of saying, well, you know, th there is this um, uh, concern, I guess I would say, about an ICSID record, even though, and, and again, it's, it, it's really investment treaty record and how that plays out in, in the public and the more losses you have, and these are complex disputes, there are very few disputes that are cut and dry, um, particularly in contractual relationships, you're going to have losses. And uh, so it, the answer to that seems to be, well, let's take it out of the controversial public um, uh, rubric and go to commercial arbitration. Now, of course, we have the ICC becoming more transparent. So it, it's sort of an interesting contradiction. And I, I will point out when this is raised is that, well, okay, but eventually if you're using state funds and you've got to make a huge payout on a claim, uh, it's going to be public. It's going to come to, to light. So the idea that commercial arbitration is, is uh, a safe haven or a better way to do it, I'm not sure really works because at the end of the day, it all comes to light. And if you've got a dispute that involves state funds and actions of state entities or quasi state entities, um, you know, it, it may be that no one is saying that you violated a treaty, which is perhaps more palatable to accept. I, I think one of the, 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 the issues is, of course, that you will still have parallel arbitrations. As long as you have treaties, you may end up with a parallel uh, arbitration, frankly. So none of that is going to go away. So I, I it, to me, there are contradictions right now. Um, but I, yes, a very long-winded way of saying I, I do think that for if we, we see what's happening with states that previously had pretty liberal models and now have pretty restrictive models, I, I think it has to have an effect. Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm asking this question not by accident because it would actually, if, if we would we face such such a move more to commercial arbitration, it would um, align a little bit the international approach with the Brazilian approach, uh, which is. Uh, it still but, has no uh, investment treaties. <laughs> it won't <laughs> still have the. Uh, it won't still have the uh... Uh, I, I'm, I'm personally not, but I think the country is. So, um, and uh, what uh, regarding transparency in these arbitrations that involve public uh, administration, we do have specific provisions on transparency uh, in, in Brazil. So, and, and also we have a, a huge discussion in this moment about transparency or publicity in general of arbitration proceedings, at least when it comes to the courts. Uh, because you might have heard, and this is a, another very important uh, field of arbitration in Brazil, um, public stock corporations, also mm -hmm. related a little bit to, to uh, initially to the corruption scandal. And uh, we, I, the court in Sao Paulo recently um, uh, decided a few cases and is pushing towards uh, more transparency. And I think this will have an impact on not only on these uh, um, arbitrations involved in public listed uh, companies in general, but, uh, but also on other arbitrations. What, what is interesting, um, sorry, is, but what is interesting in that discussion, if we're moving towards more commercial arbitration with state or state entities, um, and we already see more transparency in the ICC rules, and, and even if you use the ancestral rules. But then is the, I think the problem is the seat, whether investors will feel comfortable uh, with a seat in the host state, and whether host states will feel comfortable choosing a neutral seat. I think that's where the discussion will, will come. And I've, I've seen some contracts um, with Ecuador where we have negotiated uh, Santiago de Chile, for example, as a seat and has worked really, really well, uh, but it takes time to convince a state to accept that. 
Yeah, I, I, I fully agree. And, and you have to be very careful if you consult um, your clients regarding Brazil, for instance, the, 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 the petroleum agency and some other agencies in their concession draft agreements, they use uh, very smart clauses that say, for instance, uh, that you, if you cannot agree on an arbitration institution, uh, it shall be either the um, um, ICC, LCIA, or the permanent court in Hague. But on the other side, if you look into the regulations, then you see that the, uh, the arbitral institution must prove to be capable to conduct or to administrate arbitration proceedings onshore. So that is why the, 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 the move of the, that, that is wipes out, of course, uh, the permanent court and to, to some extent also uh, the LCIA and uh, only confirms this move of the, the ICC to go to Sao Paulo because it's actually the only institution thus far that qualifies as subject to this criteria. And I, I really think that that's a, a very important point both from the perspective of, of equal treatment, of feeling comfortable, but also for this question of whether you are uh, you prefer to um, have the need to ask for exequatur always, or run the risk of challenges in the courts, at least here in Brazil. I think this will be for us here in the next years, the crucial question for large scale arbitrations. Patricia, do you how how do you see this? What exactly? What exactly? The seat, the seat is, issue, the seat issue in commercial arbitration involving states. Uh, I mean, we're seeing that already in in, in with issues involving um, intra EU bids. Um, so we, we're. The, it's it's uh, it's a point of contention, of course, because uh, states would want the seat to be located in the EU, which would make annulment proceedings easier, and uh, investors want the seat to be located outside the EU. Um, and so, ultimately, um, again, I think we need to look at the neutrality that international arbitration offers. The uh, I, I think I'm wrapping up at this point, but the. The, uh, the neutrality, the efficiency, uh, the rationale behind, um, behind the, um, the uh, obligations entered into uh, by states uh, that we do not um, facilitate the circumvention of, of, of obligations, uh, the uh, dif different choices of the seat. And so, I think I think that's an issue that, that that's already um, in play in in uh, in at least that, that I've seen uh, come up a number a number of times, particularly as I said in the context of the EU, and then uh, we end up having judges in the in in the US deciding between the primacy of EU law versus international law. So so I, I don't think we can. If there's a move to commercial arbitration, we are going to see these disputes. And then um, I think we all know <laughs> what it means to have a seat uh, that is not neutral for both parties. I'll just yeah. leave it at that. Thank you so much. Coming back, we are heading to the, to the end of our uh, webinar. So I would like to ask Melida uh, more coming also focusing uh, at the end of the webinar, again on on energy arbitration in Latin America, what what uh, do you see as the uh, the key factors for for uh, energy arbitration in the near future in in Brazil? Yeah, not in Brazil, in Latin America in general. Sorry. Yeah, no, generally, I, I think that some of the issues that I, I pointed out before are going to be more, um, become more relevant. I think we're going to need to see tribunals just, just as, um, it, it's very similar in a way to what Patricia and Noyana have talked about in terms of corruption and in terms of damages. Frankly, I think we're going to have to see more um, sophistication, more, uh, uh, 
commitment <laughs> from arbitrators to really delve into to issues and not not just say oh we don't deal with that or we can't deal with that or we'll go seven and a half because frankly that's easier um and that's something that i feel i've experienced um uh, and really to understand the issues that underlie. So when I, I look at the, for example, environmental issues, um, they really are going to have to understand and not just say, okay, yeah, you did an environmental impact study. Maybe it wasn't the best study, but you know, still we think they should have given you the permit or something. I, I think there's really going to have to be more in-depth work on the part of tribunals to understand and to give full attention uh, and full consideration to, to these issues because they do matter and they are on a public scale. Uh, and when that level of commitment and work is not done in these kinds of disputes, it just contributes to a, a bad rap for, for arbitration. Uh, and I don't think it's only investment arbitration. I think it affects commercial arbitration even if it involves states also. Um, I think if so you have environmental and you have all of the responsibilities in terms of uh, beyond corporate social responsibility provisions in, in treaties, which have actually existed for a while, but they were sort of try to behave yourself when you're in another country kind of provisions. Now they are moving uh, along a spectrum that basically says, if you behave badly, you may not get the advantage and the benefit of this treaty. So um, I think tribunals are going to have to be looking very closely at allegations, not only of corruption, but, but also of um, failure to abide by new obligations or, that are in some way or another being imposed uh, in, in these treaties on investors. So I, I do think that's going to become, a, you know, most certainly the, the fallout from, from the car wash scandal uh, where there's probably a feeling that there still hasn't been satisfaction for, for some states uh, about this, and some states, of course, being sued by, <laughs> by the actors. Um, you know, there's going to have to be more, I, I think, more serious consideration of, of these kinds of issues. Thank you. To, to close, Philippe, do you think you're in London and you're no longer part of the European Union, unfortunately, do you think you will inherit all these arbitrations from, from the continent now? Because Switzerland is a little bit old fashioned, Singapore far away, so why not go to London? Uh, I would very much <laughs> like the idea. It would be the, the only good thing out of Brexit, in my opinion. But uh, as, as Patricia has mentioned, I'm not there to, to make a prediction on this topic. Uh, I'll just add a, a, one last comment. I noted here that uh, Merida mentioned that the um, cooperation agreements that Brazil has been uh, ratified, ratifying with uh, with 17 countries in the last five years, it's a step closer to investor state arbitration. And then you, Peter, you mentioned that it's a, an intermediate step. In my opinion, we are actually stepping away from um, a mechanism that allows the investor to have a predictable and effective mechanism against the, the state hosting the investment because those cooperation agreements they the foreign investor they they must to convince their own home country that they have been injured by the host country and then convince it, its home country to take action against the host country in a state to state arbitration I am not aware of, of any case that has been uh, filed under that mechanism, even though the, the first cooperation agreement has been signed, I believe, more than five years ago. And this whole mechanism seems opaque and likely to be ineffective. The, the foreign investor would be better off uh, okay. by resorting to commercial arbitration against Brazilian public entities. And the Brazilian investors 
in foreign countries seem to be seem to have been left to their own devices. Yeah, I, I fully agree with you. But by, by the way, uh, we see the same story as in the 90s. Just two or three of these new treaties have been ratified. And in the last five years, none of them. So we have another uh, 10 or 12 signed international treaties that are not or will never be probably ratified. Um, I think that's, <laughs> that's, that is, is, is worth mentioning. And um, we're now um, really come to the end. And uh, I thank you all, uh, Patricia, Melida, Noyana, Felipe, and our uh, the team at um, Camp CCBC, Leonardo, and um, uh, Anna Flavia for making this possible. Uh, it was uh, a great experience. Uh, I thank you also for the preparatory work, and um, it was really great. And uh, I hope really to see you soon uh, in Brazil or somewhere else. Um, I will travel soon to Europe <laughs> after my second shot by the end of the month. And um, have a nice uh, afternoon, a nice evening. And um, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Well, um, I think our time has come to an end. So I would like to thank the speakers and the moderator for the contributions today. To everyone who's still watching, thank you for, for um, being here. And the webinar has been recorded and will be available soon at CAMP CCBC's YouTube channel.